Welcome, everybody. God bless you. Glad you're here with us again on this uh, fourth of ten lectures on the Russian New Martyrs in the Catacomb Church. Such an important topic for us today, always an important topic for us to go back to the saints and to dive in always and read the lives of the saints. This should be our daily bread in the church, but this is particularly important today because we are facing, as the prophetic utterance once told us many decades ago, yesterday in Russia, today in America, and generally throughout the world, we see the rise of totalitarianism and the spirit of renovationism in the church. And so we need to know our saints, we need to know our church history, we need to know how they dealt with these temptations so that we can likewise follow in their footsteps and save our souls and help others to save theirs on the in these di difficult, difficult and cunning and evil days that we live in. So we're in lesson four, as we said, we're going to be looking at not only the satanic Bolshevik mentality methodology, there'll be some of that, but we're going to continue with some more details and important uh, developments in terms of the renovationists. And we'll finish that off tonight before we go next week into uh, aspects of the lives of the saints during this period of 1917 to 1927. That'll be next week's class, looking at the lives of the saints and how they encountered these new conditions in the, in the Russian church. And then we'll go, we'll continue essentially the story of what happened after the renovationists. And uh, you'll see tonight that we'll, we'll end uh, talking about Metropolitan Peter, who was the local tenants after St. Tikhon. And we'll pick that up again in two weeks when we look at the declaration of Patriarch, or I should rather say Metropolitan Sergius, who later became, uh, went on to become, uh, in 1945, uh, he was elevated by his bishops to Patriarch. So we'll see about that in due time, but let's start out with our prayers tonight. Let's look at, um, see our prayers, and then we'll, we'll go right into aspects of the Soviet approach to the church, the Bolshevik approach to the church, and the, um, the Orthodox response. So let's say our prayers and begin tonight. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Illumine our hearts, O Master, who lovest mankind with the pure light of thy divine knowledge. Open the eyes of our mind to the understanding of thy gospel teaching. Implant in us also the fear of thy blessed commandments, that trampling down all kind of desires we may enter upon a spiritual manner, living both thinking and doing such things are well pleasing unto thee. To thou the illumination of our souls and bodies of Christ our God, and unto thee we ascribe glory, together with thy Father, who is forever everlasting, and our holy good and life creating spirit, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Evlogito si Christeo, Theo Simon, O Pansophos, Tu salis san alixas, Cata pemsas aftis to pnevma, To aigi o angeli afton, Tiniku menis aigi nevsas, Filanthrope, <clears throat> Amen. Okay, let's uh, dive in. This is going to be a bit of both, as I said, a look at the Soviet Bolshevik mentality, which is important because it it is, of course, straight from the pit of hell and the enemy of our salvation is not very creative. He's an ape of God. He imitates what he sees. He inverts everything. And so what he baked up in the 20s, no doubt we'll see again, as that was also in some ways a rep repetition of ancient
times for the church, the martyrdom and the confessors and the, the satanic uh, uh, mentality in terms of how to torture and to and to, and to bring about the, their their satanic plan. So it's it's uh, it's going to be a bit of both tonight. We're going to look at the renovationists and how that ended, or at least. For the to a certain degree ended in the 19, 1927, how it how it deflated rather quickly, and the Soviets were a part of that uh, uh, that dissolution. So this is lesson four, as we said, and let's begin going back a little bit in time to 1921 to a telegram from A. V. Luna Charis Charsky. I'm always butchering these words, so forgive me for you Russian speakers. Who know how to speak properly? Uh, these, this is uh, a major uh, figure in the Bolshevik uh, party. One of the figureheads that went on for for quite some time to lead and to uh, be kind of the theorist, the uh, the planner behind the scenes. And he writes to Lenin about how to manipulate and destroy the church. And this is very important for us to understand how they're going to approach the church and the renovationists uh, as they go forward. And he writes the following. A significant part of the clergy, undoubtedly sensing the stability of the Soviet regime, wants to be reconciled with it. Of course, this renovated orthodoxy with a Christian socialist lining is not at all desired and finally will be eliminated and disappear. But as an active opposition to the reactionary patriarch and his supporters, it can play its role because it is based mainly on the peasant masses, the backward merchant class, and the more backward part of the proletariat. For these groups, such a temporary center of clerical unity is a great shift to the left of the one that they still find in the reactionary Orthodox Church. We cannot, of course, support the activity of Soviet Orthodoxy. It might, however, be most advantageous to render aid secretly and create in the religious arena several transitional stages on the way to atheism for the peasant masses. Okay, just unpack this a bit, and then we'll we'll comment also on whether this was totally correct. We have, of course, the advantage of hindsight, so we can see uh, to what degree uh, this was this was accurate, much more uh, than, than he could uh, see forward. So let's look at this a bit. So obviously there uh, have no interest in these poor uh, deluded folks called the renovationists who think they're going to pull one up on the on the Bolsheviks and they're going to somehow create a space for themselves in the new Bolshevik Soviet reality. It was very clear to everyone, I think, from what I can tell from the sources, that they knew that the Soviets wanted no part in any religion whatsoever, and their goal was to get rid of every religious aspect of life. So the we might describe some of these renovationists as the, the willing idiots, uh, who, for other reasons, uh, maybe there's a few, but not many who had any honorable reasons, but for careerism, as we'll see in other things, they wanted to uh, to take the reins of power and, and, and bring about the renovation that they had been talking about long before the revolution in Russia. Some of it is considered legitimate. There were legitimate things that wanted to, the, the hierarchy wanted to see and talked about in the 1917 uh Council, but a lot of this, what we'll see, is not at all legitimate and part of the Orthodox tradition. So they wanted to, some of them wanted to to use this opportunity that was given to them because the the GPU, the Secret Service, the uh, the the secret police of the Bolshevik regime approached these people, having learned of their desire to throw off the patriarch and the patriarchate. They were against the patriarchate, most of these uh, people. Uh, the same kind of people who went on after, uh, but rather the same kind of people who in 1917 were against it, 
And you see that, for instance, in St. Uh, Hilarion Trotsky, his speech during the 1917 Council, 18 Council, and the opposition to that were, were from elements that will go on to become part of the renovation. So strangely, they don't want the patriarchate to return. Uh, and they don't want, they, they want a, an inversion uh, or, or, or a takeover from below. So not interested in true orthodox ecclesiology at all. Uh, so they're going to be used by the by the the communists, and you can see here that they're they're it's a temporary uh, tool to destabilize and to move everything to the left, and this is exactly what we see in the in ever since the 1920s in America is that step by step by step everything politically and morally goes to the left, so that today. Some people think wrongly that to walk the royal path is to choose the two extremes in society. But of course, that would be gravely wrong and an error if constantly the goalposts are changing and they're going left. Who would have thought 20 years ago, even 10, 15 years ago, that today they would be trying to force down young children in school the idea? Uh, 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 that of transgenderism or transhumanism or any of the insanity that we see today in society, even just a decade or two decades or three decades ago, nobody, most people would not even imagine this could be going on. And yet here we are. So if someone were to choose today, obviously, to go the royal, to so-called go the royal path in this society, uh, meaning the middle path rather, not the royal path. Just choosing the two extremes and trying to go in the middle. Of course, they're gonna they're not not going to be in the spirit of God. They're not going to be on the royal path. This is what this is what happened in 1920s. They wanted to shift everything to the left, to the left, to the left, to the point where they would get the church. Eventually, someone would step forward and do their bidding and allow for for uh, the church to fit in. Uh, in the way that the Bolsheviks wanted it to be uh, essentially decimated and just a, a figurehead and not any threat at all to the power. They actually thought that they, the church was a threat to their power. They really believed that the church could bring about some kind of revolution, as we'll see. So they're going to the left. Uh, they, they have no intention of actually creating, it for any length of time, uh, a Soviet orthodoxy, a, a living church, a renovation of church. It's a temporary measure. And they're going to aid it secretly, essentially allow it to exist, not exile the people in, or, or persecute them and, and allow them to exist in order to, to denigrate and to, uh, to silence, if possible, Patriarch Tikhon, who had been a major adversary, probably the greatest adversary at that point uh, in uh, the Bolshevik, uh, for the Bolshevik regime in the 1920s, because he had the, the masses of people loved him and uh, looked to him for his leadership. So this is very interesting. This is, a, this is their, one of their blueprints uh, from, from one of the architects. Uh, let's go on and see a little bit about the people now who are going to uh, what what the intellectual climate is and how do they how did some of these people buy into this? Where is it coming from? It's very interesting that before the revolution, some of these same people uh, were were actually intellectually sparring and 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 were in the same intellectual circles. Uh, and it reminds me again of what Saint John of Cronstadt was saying in the late. 1890s, early 1900s, about the intellectual class being the great threat to the uh, future of orthodoxy in Russia. Similarly, this is what St. Cosmas at the Lowe said hundreds of years ago. He said, from the intellectuals, from the the anumini, the intellectuals, that's where the problem will come. That's where the, the threat and the, uh, the, the evils will come uh, in the future. Uh, and so here we go again in Russia, the same thing. And again, Throughout history, the problem is not with uh, the, the simple faithful, but it's with usually the uh, intellectuals who are rationalists, who uh, who do not submit, who who, who imitate the, uh, the Lucifer in his pride. Uh, so, here's some very interesting commentary. I think it was 
and important historical details for us to understand how we ended up, how we're going to end up in 1927, which we'll talk about in two weeks. So Leonard Tarski, who is this uh, Soviet uh, uh, spokesman, uh, and perhaps also Tuchkov, Tuchkov, I guess is how you would say it, may have had more sympathy for renovated orthodoxy than they were willing to admit, at least to Lenin. Lunatarsky was a product of what Berdayev has called the Silver Age, the period between the end of the 19th century and 1914, when there was an intense interest among intellectuals in aesthetic and religious questions. Vidensky, this is the, one of the heads of the living, the uh, renovationists, was also, like Berdayev himself, a product of the Silver Age. Lunatarsky had worked out many of his most basic ideas in dialogue with Berdayev. So, of course, Berdayev is one of the converts from uh, Marxism who became Orthodox, but was essentially a heretic, remained in, del in delusion in terms of sophiology and other things that he taught. He left Russia, became well known in, in France and in the uh, diaspora uh, for his writings, but unfortunately was not Orthodox, did not, not teach Orthodoxy. Uh, and so he's, debating and dialoguing with the people who are going to make up the Bolshevik revolution uh, and the, uh, the, the intellectual class of the Bolsheviks. And in the same climate, we have the, the renovationists. As a young man, Vividensky uh, frequented what was almost the temple of the movement, the Salon of Dmitry Merezkovsky and Zinyada Gipias, I, I'm butchering these words, forgive me, who, among much else, organize religious and philosophical encounters between intellectuals and churchmen, presided over by, and this is the important part here, presided over by Ivan Stragorodsky, Stragorodsky, I don't know how you say that, then rector of the St. Petersburg Theological Academy, later to become Metropolitan Sergei. Uh, Second patriarch after Tico in the Moscow Patriarch, if one accepts the validity of his election. So that is very, very interesting. We have these figures who are intellectually in the same milieu, milieu and there's they're, they're before the revolution, they're going back and forth and they're talking and they're and they're debating. And it's not it's not surprising uh that the uh what, how we arrived at 1927 after the fact, because this is not the climate or the area in which piety uh, is connected to truth and then blossoms forth into holiness, right? This is the methodology of the rationalist intellectuals, which has its place, but it's pretty limited, and it's not going to bring about the kind of holiness and the kind of purification, illumination that we see in the lives of the saints. So I think that is uh, very instructive and interesting. Let's talk now about a little bit about the Bolsheviks and the Renovationists and how they see and use one another for their own uh, uh, gain. Uh, the Bolsheviks feared the specter of a church-backed counter-revolution. This might seem strange to us as pious Orthodox Christians to imagine that the church would actively engage in that kind of counter-revolution. But uh, as someone wrote, it's, the church wasn't concerned with counter-revolution. They were, they were concerned with counter-renovation, uh, countering the renovationists. That was the main concern of the church, church saints and fathers in these four or five years, crucial years. Uh, they were less concerned, as we'll see, Metropolitan Peter, with the persecution than with the distortion of the faith by the renovationists. And that has got to be the case for us as well today. Uh, we've got to be on guard about the internal distortion and perversion of the church more than the external uh, persecution of the church. This commentary by... Uh, a, a academic, I thought, uh, from Slavic Review, this is from 1996, he says, they became convinced that conservative Orthodox bishops were conspiring with recent 
Russian emigres to launch a coup that would be funded by the church's wealth. The Bolsheviks decided to cultivate allies with among the, quote, Soviet Orthodox. That's not a, 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 a misnomer. I don't know what it is. In order to confiscate wealth and thwart the conspiracy, the so-called conspiracy, a conspiracy that existed only in the minds of the Bolshevik leaders who were projecting their own tactics onto their opponents. The renovationists recognized the opportunity offered by this political crisis to gain state backing for their reform program. They accepted covert governmental aid and recklessly seized control of central of the central church apparatus. We, we learned about that last week, how they essentially moved in with the help of the secret secret police and had a meeting and and, and lied to Peter Artikin and then they, they kept uh, Metropolitan Agathangelos away so they could take the power into their own hands. So they were, from the beginning, liars and cheaters and thieves. Uh, and uh, of course, nothing good was going to come of it. And that's why I titled this Antichrist and Judases, because the Antichrist were, were uh, like the Pharisees, using Judas to kill Christ. And the, and the, and the, Ju, Ju, the Judases here uh, are uh, w willingly being used and being perverted and distorted by the uh, Antichrist, the Bolsheviks. Uh, and also going along with the crucifixion of the church. They, they absolutely, you know, no matter how well motivated some of the people who got involved in this movement were, this was a grave, grave delusion. And they were certainly traitors to the church with everything they were doing by co-working uh, uh, co with the enemies, uh, the atheists, the militant atheists against the church. So let's not have any delusion about that because there's this tendency in our day also with similar situations to become very, be very naive about what's happening. Uh, because we like to always, Orthodox Christians, all Christians like to give the benefit of the doubt, not judge, of course. We shouldn't judge people's hearts. But we have to have discernment and we have to realize the spiritual reality of things and the, and the signs that are given. And when someone falls into not teaching orthodoxy, there's already a spiritual fall. It has nothing to do with their well-intended, uh, you know, mo their motivations. That's that's a secondary thing. People could be very well mo motivated and be involved in great evil. So we have to uh, have discernment to say, is this th these actions according to God? And if not, then then there there's no neutrality in the spiritual life. That well, oh, it's just a neutral issue. It doesn't matter. No, there's a war going on, and either you're on one side or the other, and you have to fight this uh, battle, and you cannot be uh, naive about, about matters. And so this is a good, I think, uh, lesson to learn here. And let's look at a little bit more closely about who's involved in the renovationist movement. And there's a variety of people, obviously, a variety, a variety of motivations. Uh, so first of all, there's a, a great amount of initially, uh, they, they didn't stick around very long. A lot of these, they, they, they jettisoned themselves from the renovation movement fairly quickly. It, it, it deflated fairly quickly. Uh, but there were these, how to put it, priest officiants, those people who, those priests who basically saw themselves as uh, in charge of the ritual, uh, didn't have much depth, didn't have much understanding of the spiritual life, uh, they carried out the ritualistic aspects of their priesthood. And they were seeking security from the storm. And they saw that the, the Soviets, the Bolsheviks, had given the living church and the renovationists cover. And so they saw this was a way to get out uh, from underneath uh, the persecution. Uh, there were also these scoundrels, as this writer puts it, uh, who joined renovationism in pursuit of a quick career, careerism. Uh, rushing to enjoy the moral, quote unquote, moral freedom, in other words, immorality, allowed by the renovationists. Bishop Antonin, the initial leader, the first bishop uh, at the first council, but later was uh, he was jettisoned for his views. They weren't all in agreement. Uh, said about them, a cesspool barrel of the Orthodox Church. In other words, the, the bottom barrel cesspool of the church joined these Folks, and we're going to see an example of that in a few, in a few slides, unfortunately, uh, how that was the case. Uh, almost all of them were agents of the G, 
P-U. In other words, they were, they were, it, there was no moral compass, there was no uh, principle, and so they would be easily used by the GPU, the secret police. They were also ideological modernists, people who were really believed in, in modernizing and uh, uh, aggiornamento, you know, what they did at the Second Vatican Council for the Orthodox Church in the 1920s. Uh, and they were sincere in their striving for what they thought would be a renewal of the church. These lived, unfortunately, they were idealists. And so they, they suffered uh, probably because they were not cunning like the rest of them. And they were relegated to rundown parishes. They were pressed by the authorities and their spiritual leaders and not recognized by the people. They almost all ended up in the camps uh, because, of course, the Soviets turned on the renovations as well eventually and sent them to the camps. And then there were the ideologues of renovationism, the, the brilliant, talented, and ambitious people who came up on the crest of a revolutionary wave, and they also were associated with the secret police. And these are the leaders, the ones that are well known that we've been talking about. <clears throat> this is a quote from, on the left here, Anatoly Krasnov Levitin Levitin. This is a well-known uh, historian, basically, of the renovationists. He himself was involved toward the, at the tail end of it in the late 40s and mid 40s. Uh, and then he was received into the Moscow Patriarchate. But he had a lot of a, a tremendous memory. He was actually a dissident. He wrote against uh, many of the abuses in the 60s of the Soviets. Uh, he died in 91. So he, he, he had quite a long life. He was born in 15, 1915. And anyway, he, he's probably one of the main sources of all the scholars that are doing work on the renovationists in this period, because he actually has had personal contact and had an amazing memory and had access during the Soviet period to a lot of the material. And he wrote uh, a, a pretty detailed history of the renovations. And he says, in the time that he joined them in the 40s, he says the following about them to give the sense. He says, there were no reforms at that time in the renovationist church. As we'll see, they, they backtracked on, on, on many of the reforms they wanted to see. When they saw that they were losing power, losing the people, then they started to backtrack on these reforms. Uh, so it was, again, just opportunism in many ways and not sincerity. But they were, there were no reforms, he says, at that time. Most priests went there simply because affiliation with the renovationism was a kind of habeas corpus act. In other words, a guarantee against arrest. In other words, all the way up until, I guess, the 40s, apparently, because I think this is what he's talking about, at least my understanding, he's talking about his experience there, but he may be talking about earlier period. It's not clear to me. But in any case, that's a, that's something that happened from the beginning, for sure, during our, our years we're looking at it, 20, 20 to 22 to 27. This was a big reason why people joined the renovations, because they were going to be free of persecution, as we said. So the renovationists, interestingly, just adopted the methodology of the Bolsheviks. They didn't have even an orthodox uh, ethos enough to understand that the methodology of the Bolsheviks was not a Christian methodology. So they used it as a model. They organized the parish clergy as a vanguard for church revolution. The cells that they created and the representatives in every diocese directed the work of renovating the church. Of course, they had to get rid of a lot of people because a lot of people were against them initially. So they had to move in like the, like, and, and in, a, in a similar way, in a political way, to try to get rid of people who were their opposition. Uh, bishops and clergy who refused to acknowledge the authority of their new ecclesiastical superiors were deposed and often arrested or exiled by the local police. One year later, having neutralized any threat of counter-revolution and fearing that the renovationists might succeed in forming a Soviet church, the Bolsheviks changed course. This is the, one of the most interesting aspects of this, uh, this time period is that the Bolsheviks very quickly betrayed the renovationists. When they saw, when they released, uh, when, when Tikhon was released after giving some kind of uh, concessions to the Soviets, what they were asking, he was released. Immediately, the people abandoned, the uh, vast majority of people abandoned the renovationists. Bishops and others who had gone over repented, came back to Tikhon, St. Tikhon and the, and the uh, Patriarchate. And so 
the, the, so the Bolsheviks said, well, the renovations aren't having success, as we'll see. They ha- they're not having success. We don't, we don't, there's no point in trying to support that. Or there was the conversely, initially they were afraid before they saw that the, the, the renovations were falling apart because there was a time when there was a lot of initial success. There was also the thought on the Bolsheviks, well, we don't want a Soviet church. We don't want them to have success. What we want is division. We want confusion. We want to undermine any kind of stability. And so they turned on the renovationists. And for the next six years, the state policy worked to split the Orthodox diocese and parishes by playing factions against one another. So they would go in and they there would be factions in one parish or one diocese, and they would they would very cunningly work to make sure that there was never peace, never stability, there was never clarity. And they would even divide parishes themselves, parishes themselves between the renovationists and the Orthodox and make them use the same building or uh, do other things that would compromise each faction. So this was the, this is an aspect of this demonic, satanic methodology and mentality of the uh, Bolsheviks. Let's go on to, <clears throat> this next part, the Orthodox response, which I think is one of the most inspiring. But before we get there, I want to look at some more aspects of the renovationist MO. And it's important for us to see this because it's a very, very important lesson uh, that we need to learn about the spiritual life and the unity of dogma and ethos. So the, the renovationist, as we've seen, we're going to repeat this a little bit. It's important. They spoke more of Christ's humanity than his divinity. They were humanists, which is not at all surprising, right? They they had a God that was basically exiled, something like uh, the deist, deist, what the deists were doing in the Enlightenment. They had that kind of approach. Uh, they wanted uh, to give. They wanted their clergy to have a creative freedom in the performance of their religious duties, as long as they avoided any hint of being anti-Soviet. So one of the main characteristics of the renovationists were subjection and 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 identifying with the Soviet agenda. Believe it or not, that's really a part, a big part of what it was to be a renovationist. Renovations would become a confederation of religious societies embodying the materialistic ideology of the new political, social, political order. The renovationists steadfastly opposed monasticism and the veneration of relics. Both of which, however, are windows or pathways to grace and salvation. So they really cut off the people. One of the reasons why they they they, they had initial uh, response among, among many of the quote, quote unquote white clergy, they gave them sh- shelter. There was uh, also a lot of white clergy who were resentful of the bishops, uh, and so they they grew quickly, and then they dis- they were disintegrating quickly because they actually undermined so much of the piety of the people. So when the people, so much of the resistance to the renovations were on the part of the faithful, simple people in the villages and in the parishes throughout uh, the, you know, tens of thousands of parishes throughout the Russian empire, the Russian, uh, the, the new Soviet Union. And so opposing monasticism, opposing the veneration of relics, is not a good idea if you want to have the base of the church. Now, the uh, Lunacharsky, if I'm saying his name right, he actually thought that the renovationists would attract the peasants. It was just the opposite, actually. The peasants rejected the renovationists. That was a major error on their on judgment of their on their part. It was the peasants, the simple faithful, who hated the renovationists because of things like this, opposing the veneration of relics and other things. So. Uh, it, the renovationists were a small elite intellectual crowd uh, who identified with uh, the, the Bolsheviks more than they did the Tsar. And so they did not have the people. The people were still, they were raised on a, a basic piety, which was totally lacking among the renovationists. The renovationists supported married bishops, a new calendar, and a second marriage for clergy, and much more, as we've seen. In the social sphere, yeah, the, the adoption of the new calendar undermined the cycle of holy days and holidays. This is another major error that they made. Uh, they, the people were very committed to the church calendar because it, it was a big part of their whole rhythm of life. 
the, the feast days, the fasting, all of it. So any change to that whatsoever was suspect and they, they lost all trust from the people, the faithful people. The new calendar was interpreted as a direct attack on the fabric of social relations. Never forgave, they never forgave the renovationist for this assault. All right, so that was very instructive, I think, because this is the base of the Orthodox Church. We have in the West, unfortunately, uh, in the diaspora, uh, not we don't have that phenomenon as much, right? We don't have that base as strong as they had in the old country in Greece and in in in, in Russia, uh, and in Romania and other places, uh, because it's a small church with many converts, and many of the people who are involved in the Orthodox Church are there, have come there, at least initially through an intellectual search. Uh, and they're intellectually motivated, intellectually drawn to the church. And so that dynamic is not as strong in the West uh, among, uh, among Orthodox, English-speaking Orthodox. And yet it is so important, and it was so important for Russia to resist the renovationists. And really, throughout the 20th century, it is, the, uh, it is this, this part of the church which has kept the faith the most in the face of all these uh, changes. Now, I want to just take a, a moment to talk a little bit about renovationism and the unity and or the, the the unity of ethos and dogma uh, and when one is violated how that leads to another uh, there's a particular case here this unfortunate archbishop evdokim uh Mercherski, who was in america in canada actually uh before returning to uh, on the eve of the revolu revolution uh returning to uh, russia and his 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 case is very interesting and instructive for us. Now he joined the renovationists when he returned. He was one of the major leaders of the, of the renovationists, eventually became the head of the renovationists, the synod. And he issued a letter along with the others accusing Patriarch Tikhon of quote, destroying the church. He worked for recognition of renovationism by the Eastern patriarchs. He was one of those, uh, the, the main figure who wanted to see the Patriarchate of Constantinople and the other Patriarchates recognized renovationism, and he worked for that. And he worked for reeling in some of the some of the more extreme renovationists, so that they could maintain a face and a credibility with the with the uh, Eastern Patriarchs. He was one of the only three hierarchs of which remained in the schism until the end of his life. He never repented. He never repented. And listen to this. Listen to what Archbishop uh, Anthony Krakowiczki says about. Evdokim, uh, which is very important. And we're going to see another slide on this. In response to his appeal to the emigre clergy to join the revolution, renovationists, which is, which is rather comical, but in any case, I mean, certainly there were people who were interested in, the, in, in America at the time. Uh, but Metropolitan Anthony writes that Evdokim has had numerous concubines and illegitimate children and thus, most probably, he has been blackmailed by the GPU to join and head the schism. If this is true, then, the subsequent refusal of Patriarch Tikhon to deal in particular with Evdokimo is self-explanatory. Indeed, they brought, they wanted to have, as we'll see, uh, Patriarch Tikhon have a dialogue with the renovationists at some point, and they wanted him to dialogue with Evdokimo, and he flatly refused. Uh, as as Metropolitan Anthony says here, probably because of this reason, there was no way and no no way he would entertain uh, such a dialogue. Uh, listen to this as well. This goes along with this whole stance and reality here. Uh, so they recognized we said married bishops, which is which was of course. A total innovation at the time in the Orthodox Church. And to this day, this has never been seriously entertained for a variety of reasons. People can talk about this. We can talk about the history of it. But this is the reality. It was an innovation at the time, and it still would be uh, unless some major things change, which it doesn't look likely. Uh, and they recognized the, the right of widowed priests to remarry, which is something that we I understand, uh, and I haven't seen the documents myself, so... But I've been told, and there's been some publication of it, that the Patriarch of Constantinople has done the same to this recently. 
And there are some in different local churches who would like to see this happen. So this is a renovationist position, okay? So renovation is not an orthodox position. It's a renovation position in the 1920s in Russia. Monasteries were to be tolerated only as working communes in areas distant from the cities. And this, this sounds totally foreign to orthodoxy. Of course it is. And it is a, a part and parcel of the Bolshevik approach. Of course, the Gregorian calendar, we said, was approved. But I want to focus on the moral aspect of this. Listen to what this story of the renovationist says, uh, who is not some bastion of traditional orthodoxy. He, he has elements in his writing and his stances which don't really uh, inspire. But it, it, it's very interesting. He says, this license that they gave to widowed priests to marry, married bishops to be recognized, monasteries to be tolerated, basically to be transformed into communes, soon denigrated into general promiscuity among the renovationist clergy. So let's keep that in mind. Let's keep that in mind. We have an historical example here in the recent past where these innovations quickly lead to a disintegration of morality among the clergy. And without these innovations, we have this massive temptation today with that going on all around the Christian world. How much more if we actually start to innovate and compromise with the spirit of the world? So here is an example. Uh, you can see two examples here uh, that point us to the connection of ethos and dogma. What, how do they arrive at, at the throwing off the orthodox dogma uh, and being becoming ecumenist, becoming uh, those who embrace Kessero papism and compromise with the state and all the rest. Look at their life. Look at how they lived. Look at the compromises they make in the ethical, spiritual realm, and then you'll see they are inseparable. You choose one, you choose to, to, to deny one, you'll deny the other. You're faithful to one and and you and you struggle to be faithful to the other. That's what makes you an Orthodox Christian and will keep you on the straight and narrow. There's no compromise. And this, this artificial distinction that people throw together today, which is, which is theoretically correct, but in reality is, is, is far from, from the truth, uh, that, uh, well, it's not a question of dogma. It's not a question of heresy. Strictly speaking, it's not about the Holy Trinity or about Christ. Therefore, we must be, obey our bishop. We must go along with the program, that's actually uh, not an orthodox stance at the end of the day. Because if we understand that it's a, it's a one organic whole, and when you depart from one, you depart, you're going to depart from the other, we're going to resist in a orthodox manner, patristic manner. This is very important. The way of resistance is very important. You can't do it in a worldly way. You can't do it in a, in a Protestant way. You can't do it in a reactionary, you know, worldly, political way. You have to do it in an orthodox way. But you are going to resist the innovations also in terms of ethos, not personal sins, but when they're transformed, translated like they are here to the ecclesiastical, ecclesiological level, they're absolutely considered uh, in, a, in, the, in, in, a, in a way like heresy into the church, right? If somebody is saying that we should receive, accept, uh, uh, and, and deny the teachings of the church uh, with regard to sexual promiscuity, uh, sexual relations outside marriage, sexual relations between same sexes, all these things which are total innovations and denial of the Orthodox Church teaching for 2,000 years. This is not something that we have to resist. It's something that is not dogmatic. It's not, it's not a question of dogma. Of course it is. It's, it's inseparable from... So this, this, this distinction we make is, is, is a theoretical distinction. In reality, it's inseparable in life. You cannot separate the two. When you do, uh, when you depart from one, you will, again, depart from the other. So this is unfortunately one of the characteristics of the renovationists and uh, brought a, even quicker their demise in the, in the eyes of the, of the faithful, uh, the, the, the simple faithful. They rejected the renovationists for this as well. So the Bolshevik creation was considered by the faithful, not just a schism, but a heresy. This is important. Uh, most Orthodox, most people, most Christ Orthodox Christians in Russia remained in the Orthodox Church and rejected renovationism entirely. 
And this is captured in some stories, some very in instructive stories that we have in some of these that come down to us in some of these sources and have been collected by scholars since the 1980s. Uh, and we have a lot of those, a lot of the material now, which is available, which is very instructive. And this is a, this is a secret police report from July of 1925, right at the heart of the renovationist schism. Members of the Paris Council in the village of Begunica vigorously agitated against the renovationist movement, saying, Renovationist priests are commissars in cassocks. They support Soviet power because it pays them. They betray the people. They don't believe in God. They burn icons and rob churches. God has sent Soviet power to punish us for our sins. If people will pray as they did in the past, then the Lord God will deliver us from all this evil. So that is a from a police report. It's an obviously candid report of what they saw, the faithful rejecting out of hand the renovationists as essentially an extension of the of the Antichrist Soviet power. And this attitude extended to the renovationist episcopate as well, not just to the clergy or to the lay people. During a procession from Ustyuga to Kotovalo, I'm I hate butchering these words. I wish I knew how to say them properly. Led by a renovationist bishop, the Tikanites, quote, the Tikanites, the Orthodox, in other words, sent monks ahead who told the populace not to receive this hierarch because he was a communist imposter and a servant of Soviet power. So this is the reaction. We'll see some more going forward of the faithful. They did not uh, stand by and say, well, we have a lot in common. Uh, let's let's work with the renovationists. Uh, they weren't. They didn't do the ecumenism of today, basically, right? They didn't have this ecumenistic, syncretistic, uh, relativistic approach. Uh, they didn't say, "Well, we have a lot, a lot in common. Let's let's work uh, on uniting with the renovationists, and we'll work with them, and we'll we'll get rid of you know over time, we'll we'll come to an understanding." No, they had the right orthodox approach, the approach of the Apostle Paul with the Judaizers. Who, who's comparatively erred very little compared to these renovationists or many heretics throughout the church history. And yet Paul was absolutely sh very strict in rejecting them as preaching another gospel, another gospel, he says, heteron evangelion, nothing less. So this is the stance of the Orthodox throughout church history. That's why the Orthodox Church exists to this day, because they did not approach these questions as somehow uh, up for discussion or negotiable. There is no discussion on things that have been passed down generation, generation, generation in terms of dogma and ethos. The church uh, does not seek a new revelation or a new idea, especially not from the Soviets. So the people are the protectors of the faith. This is a basic rule of orthodoxy. If we go back to the 1848 encyclical of the, all the patriarchs, the Pope, that's exactly what they say. The people are the protectors of the faith. The people don't want innovation. The people will reject innovation. It's exactly what happened in Russia in the, with the renovationists. Time and again, petitioners ask Commissariat of Justice to stop state officials from supporting the reformers in their removal and arrest of hierarchs, their attempt to change orthodox practice, their interference in parish affairs, and their promotion of material interest of parish clergy. Congregations resented government interference in their internal affairs and the alliance between the renovationists and the state. Especially suspicious was the numerous local Orthodox leaders who suddenly converted to renovationism. So they resented it. These are the people. These are not the, the local clergy. Now, people out there today, there might be faithful out there who feel betrayed by their clergy just like they were betrayed in those days. Unfortunately, there was a resentment on the part of the quote, white clergy, as we said, against the monastic bishops. There was a division on some level, not of course across the board, but there was there was some room for the enemy to work and divide the, the priests from the bishops. And, and there was a lot of uh, poverty among the priests. There was a lot of neglect by the state and by the church, hierarchy to the priests. And so there was resentment and there was a desire among some to to, to achieve economic and, 
political stability and, 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 and recognition. And so they followed the innovationists, essentially dividing themselves from the people. And the people had to stand up to their own priests who had been come, had become renovationists. They had to stand up and resist. Is this an example for us? Certainly it is. The faithful always have to stand. Every one of us has to have uh, a, a personal experience of the creed. And when we confess it, to believe it and to understand what we're confessing and to pledge ourselves to defend the faith that we confess. Absolutely. And this is a great example for us, the resistance to the renovationists. Betrayed by those they trusted and worried by the innovators of the reformers, the Orthodox masses were convinced that renovationism was foreign to the faith and some likened it to a religion of the Antichrist. So the faithful, they didn't wait for someone in academia or one of the hierarchs to tell them this is the spirit of Antichrist that they're encountering. They knew it from experience. In one of the stories there in Lipetsk province, most Orthodox believers refused even to enter renovationist churches for fear of receiving the mark of the Antichrist. Now, some of our enlightened intellectuals today will say, well, that's stupid, uh, ignorant uh, peasants who don't understand. It wasn't, they, they, of course, they weren't the Antichrist. Of course, they were of the spirit of the Antichrist. Absolutely. The spirit of the Antichrist has been, as St. John says from the epistles, from the day one, it's been in the world. The spirit of Antichrist is secularism. And this was a very, very secularized, worldly version or distortion of orthodoxy. And the people understood that instinctively. They had an experience of the, the ethos of orthodoxy. They had a spiritual nobility about them. And they understood that the that departure from the narrow path of asceticism uh, in the moral realm and the spiritual realm and departure from the tradition, the holy tradition, equals a departure from Christ and therefore a secularization, a worldly uh, emptying of the spiritual power of the church. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. And it is, of course, in many ages, we've seen the spirit of Antichrist. It doesn't mean that we're before the actual Antichrist, we're before the last days, the last seven years. Of course not. It, it, we might, uh, might be, might not be, but it's, re it's a cyclical repetition throughout history. We can see again and again that spirit of Antichrist. Uh, from the early church throughout the, the, the age. I mean, Islam and its persecution of orthodoxy was another version of the spirit of Antichrist. Uh, so, again, we have other stories here that illuminate how the Orthodox dealt with renovationism. Many faithful rejected the renovationist claim to be the authoritative governing body of Russian orthodoxy. In a petition to the Commissar Commissariat of Justice, from January 1923, parishioners from Moscow's Valam Monastery argued against transferring his property to the renovation's high authority because it was a completely different organization in religious spirit. So they didn't look just legalistically at what was going on with the renovations. Did they have the actual authority or not on a legal plane? Did they have the recognition of the state? This is what some people are doing today with certain groups of Orthodox. No, they looked at the spirit, the, the ethos, the orthodox way, and they understood if it had the spirit of God or not. Most of the faithful steeped in orthodox tradition branded the renovationists as a new faith. Not just, because remember now, before revolution, there were people in the orthodox church who were talking about making some of these changes. And in 1917, there was discussion of some of these changes, right? That there was no action taken, and there was no, never a conciliar decision. So some might have thought, well, look, we've been discussing this. These people who want to make these changes, they're, they're part of the Orthodox Church. We've heard this before. No, no, they didn't, they didn't buy into that. It wasn't really only about the changes they wanted to make. It was about their subjugation to the Antichrist powers of the Bolsheviks. That's what was the key. And also the moral departure of, of individuals who... Uh, who departed from and de and departed from the church calendars? We said and other things. It was all it was it was all together. 
But certainly on the hierarchy of things, it was most egregious, their total uh, com complicity before the Bolsheviks and uh, being used by the Bolsheviks against the church. A priest serving in the countryside near Kazan reported that in his remote area, the people shared rumors of a new faith in Moscow. They did not recognize icons or keep the fasts. And most important was being supported by Soviet power and has just become the state religion of the uh, Russian Federation or the Russian Soviet, uh, which will become the Soviet Union. So there you have another example of the uh, intuitive, heartfelt response of the faithful. Orthodox lady sought to keep renovationists and other agents of the Soviet state out of their parish affairs. Both the Bolsheviks and the renovationists were a threat in this regard, since there existed insoluble conflicts with, between everyday deeply embedded Orthodox life and the new society which was emerging. So they saw the renovationists as a part and parcel of the rejection of their way of life, of the Orthodox way, the old way. Parishioners responded to this threat by driving the movement from the holy ground, that is, out of the parish church building, denouncing renovations as a heresy that had to be expunged, lest it defile the holy faith. They did not stop after liberating a specific church from renovations apostasy. Their goal was nothing less than the reclaiming of every parcel of orthodox ground from these traitors to the faith. Now, mind you, the person writing this is an academic. It's not a monk or a priest. He is writing this, and he's writing on the basis of everything he's found in his research from the archives and, and, and what he's seen as the overwhelming response of the faithful. So this is not a biased researcher painting it to make it look the Orthodox look good. This is a scholar who is his job is to report what he's finding in, in his research. And he, I want to just stress the... the uh, the Greek word is, is much better, but in English, I guess translated as manliness. I mean, the courage, the, the strength of these faithful, uh, uh, the decisiveness, uh, the, 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 the risk they're taking, uh, the boldness in, in, in confessing the faith and in resisting heresy. It, this reminds us of, for instance, the Council of Florence when they return, and the story is that they threw the, they threw the hierarchs out. They, they rejected them out of hand physically were angry at the betrayal of the faith. This is the, this reminds us of during the iconoclast, the first martyr uh, of the, uh, the iconoclast heresy was some women who went down, who went when there was a soldier sent to remove the icon from the, from above the, uh, the gate, the icon of Christ uh, above the gate going to the palace, I think it was. Uh, they put the, the ladder, the soldier went up, and these women threw the soldier down and actually killed the soldier. I think this is my my understanding. And they became martyrs. They were they were executed. Those are the first martyrs against the iconoclasts. This is the response of the faithful. Not that we become violent, but but we of course not. The methodology is still going to be deeply Christian, but it doesn't mean we are we become doormats. It doesn't mean we we just oh well, you know peace, love, and, and harmony. This is this is not the this is not the orthodox response. That's not love. Love is to confess and to resist the destruction of the church, the destruction of the temple, the destruction of the faith uh, uh, when it's being uh, when it's being uh, threatened. Uh, this is the orthodox response, not uh, any kind of um, uh, passivity uh, before the destruction of the things of God. Okay. Yes, we love our enemies absolutely. But when they attack Christ, we defend. When they attack the church, we defend the church. We don't, loving the enemy doesn't mean that we're going to become a doormat to this, the powers of Antichrist and those who wish to destroy the church. So interestingly, as we said, the Soviets turned on the renovationists fairly quickly. And already in June and August, when Patriarch uh, Tikhon is released, uh, we see that the, the, renovationists immediately start to fall apart. Uh, they show disunity. Of course, they had disunity from the beginning. Uh, there was not much unity among them. Uh, there was intrigues to get rid of Antonin, Antonin uh, 
who was forcefully retired in the, on the 25th of June in 1923, and he was replaced by Abdokim, the one we've been talking about, who was ethically compromised. And seeing this array in the schism after the Patriarch's release, its desertion by thousands of the clergy and its empty churches, instead of repenting, the poor man, he doubles down in collusion with the, with the Secret Service. He decides to regain some respectability for the renovationists by bringing their organization more in line with the traditional Orthodox Church. Now that they've, they've, they've showed their hand, they've showed that they're innovationists, that they're of the world, that they're working with the Bolsheviks, it is the height of na naivete on the part of this man to think that, that by, by dialing a few things back, he's going to now save the boat that's sinking. It's rather uh, tragic. A hurriedly assembled conference in August of 1923 annulled most of the radical uh, decisions of the recent sober. It also renamed itself the Russian Orthodox Church, returned to the old calendar, and installed a traditional synod at the top. So they understood that these changes had undermined any credibility among the faithful. They, they reclaimed the name, they throw off the innovationist names, uh, the, they they re reclaimed the calendar, which the, the faithful did not want to be see changed, and they set up a traditional sin at the top, and of course uh, the bishops. So the the uh, renovationists like uh, the Videnski, who wanted to see uh, essentially the lower clergy run the church, are now put in uh, in their place, and this bishop. Uh, innovator that he was and compromise that he was he, ret he, re he returns the church to some or to the the renovations to some semblance of an orthodox church as one of its last attempts to re regain popular support the renovationist leadership appealed to the patriarch of constantinople very interesting this is a very interesting part pay attention Mis misinforming him of the real russian church situation they're lying they're lying to constantinople because that's 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 important to remember however Contrary to Orthodox canons, forbidding interference in one of one ruling bishop in the internal affairs of another, they appealed to Tikhon. They respond to the, the innovationists. They believe what they're saying. I mean, this is years now, at least one or two years. They 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 should have learned by now who these renovationists were, uh, and they appealed to Tikhon for the sake of the schismatics supposedly for the peace of the church, uh, that he retire and he recognize, and they recognize the renovations as the Orthodox Church of Russia, right? So this is absolute betrayal of the Orthodox Church on the part of Constantinople. They were lied to, so that is some degree of uh, extenuating circumstances, let's say, for Constantinople, but even so, unbelievable. But this did not weaken Tikhon's prestige and popularity in Russia, of course, uh, the number of, a number of participants in the Conference of Clergy of the Moscow Renovationist Diocese in June 1903 now see the writing on the wall, and they force the Renovationist leaders to begin reconciliation talks with the very patriarch whom they had defrocked, and thus their act of defrocking has reduced them to a comedy. And they do. They, 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 they're forced probably by the GPU, the Secret Service, but also by people in their own ranks to figure out what they're gonna do, how they're gonna saw, save the boat from sinking. So let's go back to Patriarch Tikhon, who's now been released and everybody's running to him. And let's see if we can sa save our skin as well. And yet it just shows how they have no authority because their own defrocking is, 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 is ignored by themselves. They, they themselves have ignored their, their own the defrocking of the Patriarch. So now we're moving to 1924-25 and the Soviet power strangely and on the face of it, it is bizarre, uh, is now going and pushing the two groups to unification talks. So only one year later, one and a half, two years earlier, you had, in 22, them fomenting a, a split in the church. And now the church, two years later, is supposedly going to be reunified, and the, the, the Secret Service wants to see unity. Uh, the answer lies in the dismal failure of the subservient renovationists to attract and keep the masses of Orthodox believers in their fold. 
All right. So the Secret Service says, look, the renovations aren't going anywhere. They're not going to they're not going to be what we need. They're going to fold. So what are we going to do? Well, let's unify them. Let's get them in to the patriarchal church. We'll see why in a second. At the end of 22, the Soviet government handed over to renovationists all of all kinds, nearly two thirds of all functioning churches in, the, in Russia at the time and, and Central Asia, uh, not counting Ukraine and Belarus, close to 20,000 churches. All right, so 20, in 22, 20,000 churches are forcibly converted to renovationist churches. Uh, by the end of 26, now, four years later, Total figure for all 84 dioceses of the renovationist church, including the Ukraine and some 30 renovationist parishes in North America. Interestingly, they went over to the renovations in North America as well, some of them, was only 6,000. So they started with 20,000, didn't have Ukraine and Belarus. When they had Ukraine and Belarus and 30 in America and Canada, they still only had 6,000. So they lost 15,000 or more. In a few years, they lost all those parishes. So obviously, the writing's on the wall. Uh, this may be compared. The, the, this is uh, uh, this is from the book by. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Postprilovsky. I can't say his name. And this is compared to the thirty thousand or so parishes across the whole Soviet Union in the Patriarchal Church as late as 1930, when enforced mass closure of churches had been occurring already for two years. All right, so even then, after two years of forced closing, they still had 30,000, whereas the renovations had six. So that gives you a sense of what happened in that time period and how it it, it, it blew up and then it deflated and it, it was uh, already imploding uh, very quickly. It was this failure of the renovations that forced the Soviet government to modify their early policy of divide and conquer, which is, of course, demonic, right? Divide and conquer, that's how the devil works. That's why the big problem with the enemy is not what he's saying, not what heresy. He's got a variety of heresies. He's got all kinds of delusions that he introduces throughout church history. It, it, that doesn't matter to him. What lie that you believe, right? As long as you believe it and you follow him. It's the division that he wants, right? So uh, this is why some people fall into thinking that ecumenism is a good idea because they know that the enemy wants division. They think unity is of God, but what kind of unity, right? We'll get into that another time, but what kind of unity? Unity in Christ, unity in the truth. So, so false unity is division from God. So it's still the enemy working uh, in most of the uh, ecumenical movement today, it's still the enemy because truth has been sacrificed for the sake of external uh, unity in many places, in many ways, and, and you know, trampling on the canons and on the church teaching and all the rest. But the enemy who is divide and conquer is his MO. Now he changes and he's insisting on unification in order to achieve full control over the patriarchal church by infiltrating her administration with the GPU agents from the renovationist church, such as Krasnitsky or Evdokim. All right, so they're saying, look, let's get them together and then let's put our guys in there and let's have our moles and our, our secret agents and our tools who are beholden to us because they're, they're, they're ethically uh, compromised or we know we can buy them out. Let's get him back into that church now that we can't conquer it by the way of uh, a schism. Uh, let's, let's take it over that way. And so that's, that's why they changed their tune. Again, it's, it's all about divide and conquer. It's still the same MO, right? They still want to divide and conquer. The failure of this plan annoyed Tukov, who may have been implicated in Tikhon's unexpected death. Now, this is very interesting. According to the late Father Alexander Tol Tolsky, a former doctor of the Botkin Hospital where Tikhon had died, confessed to him that the Patriarch had been poisoned by GPU agents, by Secret Service agents. Levitin, Levitin cites the renovationist metropolitan of Leningrad, Platonov, among such agents and informants. So we actually have several people who are saying, yeah, he didn't, he's a martyr. 
he's not just a confessor. He was killed by the Secret Service, by the Secret uh, Police, rather, uh, because you know what? They got sick. They got sick of having to deal with somebody who had all the people behind him. They had to get rid of Tikhon, St. Tikhon, in order to find some someone who will do their bidding at the head of the Orthodox Church in Russia. And unfortunately, they did find somebody eventually um, who went along with their uh, their ideas. So Metropolitan Peter, and here's where we're going to uh, more or less come to an end here. A few more slides, uh, but we're going to pick up where we leave off here in two lessons. Uh, Metropolitan Peter, who replaced the deceased patriarch as his locum tenens, had applied considerable pressure on Patriarch Tikhon to induce him to follow a policy of maximum reconciliation and accommodation within the limits, of course, with the Soviet government. The latter, as well as the renovationists, apparently mistook this stance of Metropolitan Peter as a sign that once in power, he will be more pliable and willing to come to a reconciliation with the renovationists and the state as well. And this was a mis miscalculation because St. Peter, the higher martyr, proved even more uncompromising on the issue of the renovationists than the late patriarch. In fact, he considered them a greater threat to the church than the Soviet government's physical persecutions. He hoped that by proving the complete civic loyalty of his church to the Soviet government, he would win the necessary freedom to deal with the renovation. So he said, look, we got two enemies. One kills the body, the other one kills the soul. Let's deal with the body. Let's do whatever we have to do without compromising our soul to get them, put them at bay, if that's possible, to get rid of the, the one that's killing the soul, the renovationists who are the heresy. Heresy is far worse than persecution. And, you know, just like death is not the worst thing, right? Death is not, people think death is the worst. They fear death. No, death is not the worst. Hell is much worse than death. And hell comes about when you don't love the truth. So heresy is a path to hell. During 1925, the renovationists were preparing for their second sober, to which they hoped to bring Metropolitan Peter and delegates from his diocese. They aimed at achieving some form of reunif reunification, or at least to show a unity which would win them some respect, <laughs> a little respect <laughs> among the laity and the continuation of state support. Their sober did not convince the Soviets of the renovationists' internal use international usefulness to them as it failed to induce important foreign churches to send their delegates. So finally, no one among the ancient patriarchates, not even Constantinople, who was playing politics and with the life of St. Tikhon, they, uh, they didn't send delegates either, apparently, to this particular council in 25. I think they had been uh, attending, uh, at least some, one representative had attended earlier councils. So the failure of the sober to, to, of the council of the renovations to induce Peter, Metropolitan St. Peter, to attend any of the sessions may have caused the, the secret police to begin a slander campaign against Metropolitan Peter. And eventually they're gonna send him, we're gonna get to this in two weeks, they're gonna send him into exile and uh, Metropolitan Sergius is going to come and be the, uh, the deputy local tenants. And we'll talk about that in two weeks. So what, let's just finish this up and talk about the decline or maybe the mutation that's what we'll discuss in two weeks of the renovationists. Now, the, 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 let's say, accepted popular version is that there was a decline and a, an end to the renovationists. And to a certain degree, that's true. The renovationists, if we're talking about renovationists, we mean the particular leaders of the renovationist movement and not generally the, the, the phenomenon of renovationism. It did come to an end, came to an end, as we're going to see in the 1940s. Uh, it lost support through the 20s, as we said, despite reorganization and an attempt to reunite disparate elements by calling a second renovations to National Council. We just saw that in October 25. As we said, true Orthodox believers saw everyone in the living church movement as traitors who had sold out to the communists. It's very important. We need clarity in these things. This is not... This is not a, oh, maybe a little bit. No, these are traitors to the church, period. The movement declined dramatically throughout the 1930s, as did the Orthodox Church in general. In other words, they were persecuted severely by the Orthodox Church, by the uh, Soviet Bolsheviks. The living church movement experienced a short-lived revival during the first years of World War II, 
when Soviet persecution of religion eased and Videnski became leader of the movement. In 1943, Stalin permitted senior Moscow Patriarchate bishops, we're talking about a handful, just a few, uh, to reinstate a national church administration. A month later, he approved a plan to merge renovationist parishes with the Moscow Patriarchate, and Videnski opposed this decision, but his death in July of 46 officially ended the Living Church movement. He actually wanted to reconcile with the Moscow Patriarchate, but he wanted to be received either, I think, as a bishop or a priest, and that was refused to him, and so he stayed in his own, and he died uh, as you know, a Living Church bishop. Uh, for decades afterwards, however, bishop or Orthodox believers used living church and renovationists as synonyms for religious traitors. All right, so renovationist e equals a religious traitor, a tra traitor to the church in uh, Orthodoxy. Now, a final quote from this uh, this uh, dissident, Soviet dissident historian of renovationism, himself was for a time in the renovation. He actually made a deacon by this uh, Videnski. Uh, left and went to the Moscow Patriarchate. But he's probably the most knowledgeable and the most accessible in terms of our knowledge of the renovationists and their mentality. And he says the following, renovationism turned out to be a hoax. Instead of true renewal of the church, it was servility to the NKVD and careerism. And this is somebody who was, and it was as again, a time in the renovation so that that i think that's how i want to end the renovations that's what they were all about they were about the spirit of the world and but that's the kind of antichrist pseudo church that will exist at the end times will bow down to the antichrist they will have the exterior appearance of the church of christ the orthodox church and yet they will be totally corrupt within. And this is a type of the end times. This is an image of what we will see in the end times. When the same Antichrist spirit that took over Russia and the Bolsheviks and infiltrated the church and took people out of the church into renovations, that same Antichrist spirit will return. And we even more cunning, I think, in the end day, in the end times. All right, let's end this with the Solovki Memorandum in 1927, and it does it 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 might seem a little bit outside the purview of this uh, talk, lecture, but it, it isn't. And I want to end this because I want a total clarity about the Orthodox Church position on the Soviets and what is possible in terms of. Uh, our, our stance with antichrist uh, powers in this world. In May 1927, a memorandum was issued, presumably smuggled out by a group of bishops imprisoned in what had been the Solovki or Solovets monastery near the border with Finland, famous ancient monastery going back a thousand years. Or I'm not sure actually when it was founded, but many, many hundreds of years. And so uh, this is the beginning of the gulag according to Solzhenitsyn. This is where it started. This was the, the major, first major uh, st stop in the creating of the network of labor camps. Most of the bishops and clerics in prison, <clears throat> the memorandum claimed, were there because of their refusal to recognize the renovationists. So that's very interesting. Now, they were also there after a few months, because this was before the declaration by Patriarch Surges. So everyone there at that point uh, were there, as it says here, by the renovations. Quickly, Solovki, in the next two to three years, will fill up with those who refuse to sign and accept the declaration of, Met of Metropolitan Surges. But at this point, they're there because of the renovationists. So the renovationists were a tool for the Soviets, the, the Bolsheviks, to figure out who's faithful and who will not bow their knee to Baal and to exile them to Solovki. It argued that the church could coexist with the Soviet state on the basis of a strict separation of powers under which, quoting the summary now from this book of Poskielowski, I'm probably butchering that, 
the church will not interfere in the social economic activities and reform of the state and in the fulfillment by citizens of their civic duties. All right, so let's let's understand what this is saying here. It's not saying what Sergius will say, obviously, in two years. Uh, while the state will cease to interfere in the spiritual activities of the church and to hinder the spiritual life of its citizens. St. Tikhon had declared the obligation of civil civic loyalty in 1923. And according to this author, not a single cleric had been sentenced for anti-Soviet activities by a Soviet court. All had been sent there by administrative action. So at least on for the sake of the appearance, the Soviets were not sending people after after uh, going to court uh, on some basis of some kind of law, uh, but they were they were sent there by administrative action. Maybe it was a way, another way of getting around it and sending the Orthodox to, to exile. But that's not the important part of this memorandum. This is what we need to focus on. The memorandum nonetheless laid out the utter incompatibility of the church's teaching with what it calls communism as expressed in the philosophy of the atheist state. The church recognizes the spiritual principles of existence. Communism rejects them. The church believes in the living God, the creator of the world, the leader of its life and destinies. Communism denies his existence, believes in the spontaneity of the world's existence and in the absence of rational ultimate causes of its history. <clears throat> the church assumes that the purpose of human life is the heavenly fatherland, even if she lives in conditions of the highest development of material culture and general well-being. Communism refuses to recognize any other purpose of mankind's existence but material welfare. The ideological differences between the church and the state descend from the apex of philosophical observations to the practical sphere of ethics, justice, and law. Communism considers them to be a conditional result of class struggle and assesses the phenomena of the moral sphere exclusively in terms of utility. Some of these things exactly apply today to some of the movements, the ideological movements and neo-Marxism uh, that we're seeing in the West. The church preaches love and mercy, com communism, camaraderia, I don't know how you say that, and merciless struggle, the church instills in believers humility, which elevates the person. Communism debases man by pride. The church preserves chastity of the body and sacredness of reproduction. Communism sees nothing else in marital relations but satisfaction of the instinct, instincts. The church sees in religion a life-bearing force which serves as the source of all greatness in man's creativity, as the basis for man's earthly happiness, sanity, and welfare. Communism sees religion as opium, drugging the people and relaxing their energies as the source of their suffering and poverty. The church wants to see religion flourish. Communism wants its death. Such a deep contradiction is the, in the very basis of their Weltanschungen precludes any intrinsic approximation between the church and state, as there cannot be any between affirmation and negation. All right, I'm going to repeat that. Precludes any intrinsic approximation between the church and the state, as there cannot be any between affirmation and negation. Because the very soul of the church, the condition of her existence, and the sense of her well-being is that which is categorically denied by communism. Categorically denied by communism. All right? So this is the witness of the saints, the confessors, the picture of the clergy in the Solovsky camp. I'm not sure what this dates from, and I'm not sure if I... Uh, I'm sure if somebody who is well as well acquainted with all these faces can point out some of these saints uh, that we have glorified. But these are the voice of the martyrs in the church. And that is the end of lesson four. I hope that this has been profitable for you. You've gotten a good sense of the spiritual dynamic behind 
the demonic rather dynamic behind the Bolsheviks and the renovationists and the Orthodox response, which is uncompromising and uh, is not, uh, cannot be reconciled with the Bolsheviks and their plans of every age. All right, let's, uh, let's take our questions. So John, no questions yet, just a lot of comments. I've got a few over at the uh, Crowdcast. I'll go there, and we'll begin there, and we'll come back for your questions here at the YouTube. So let's see what we got. Uh, Helen asks, I understand that the lady are not to be, uh, where'd it go? I understand the lady are not to be obedient to clergy who are counseling in heretical ways. Father Sabas, are you ready? recently explained about this. I'm wondering about monastics and their obedience. If they find themselves in a situation, such a situation, what are they to do? Especially the ones who are not hermits and live synabitically. Well, the same principle applies to all Orthodox Christians, no matter if you're in the monastery, you're married, uh, that we do not have a ultimately blind obedience. In terms of faith, dogma, we do not follow the bishop if he is not teaching the faith once delivered. He's not teaching that which has been accepted by the ecumenical councils and by the church throughout its history. We do not uh, follow them into their heresy and delusion. Uh, as we saw during the time of the renovationists, we had obviously, what, what would our contemporary blind uh, advocates of blind obedience say if they were in 1924 Russia, they were in a parish or a diocese which was taken over by the renovationists. Their bishop became a renovationist. What would they say? Blind obedience? No, of course they wouldn't. They would say this is a clear sign of this man is an apostate from the church and we must obey uh, the church hierarchy that is true, is faithful. Uh, and not this bishop or this priest that is. So there is there is no such thing as total blind obedience in the Orthodox Church. That's a major error on the part of, part of a lot of people today. Now, having said that, we have to have the discernment to understand what is a, is the Orthodox faith and how is it violated, right? So that, that presupposes that all of us know our faith and there is no way around that. And again, if there was a a general rejection of the renovationists, as you saw, they went from 20,000 to 6,000 parishes in about a year and a half. How did that happen? Because the faithful knew orthodoxy. They had an experience of orthodoxy, enough of them uh, in enough places, enough parishes around the Russian church, that they didn't have to wait for someone to tell them that these are innovators and not the spirit of God. And that is what the Orthodox Church again and again has had in the face of heresy throughout its history following the saints and not the heretics in order to overcome the various betrayals. Usually, as we said, the big problem, like, like St. Peter said, St. Peter, the higher martyr said, the problem is, the greater problem is renovationism. The greater problem is heresy. The greater problem is delusion in the church, far worse than any persecution. So the same applies in the monastery. If the abbot follows the heretical teachings of a bishop or a synod or the world or whatever it is, he's an apostate, the monks get up and leave or they, they, they eject him because they're not going to, they're no longer under obedience since he is no longer obedient to Christ. See, it's a, there's a hierarchy and there's a line, obedience to Christ but on the part of the bishop or the abbot, we are obedient to the abbot and then we're saved. That's how the Lord set it up. He gave his apostles the power to bind and loose and, and throughout history, he will be with us. That's how the church works. That's how the Lord intended it. it. But the presupposition is faithfulness. So if there is someone who's innovating and departing from the holy tradition, departing from the ethos of the church, departing from the dogmas of the church, and these things are made public and they're preached and defended, then we, we are, have to be on guard, vigilant, and not follow 
Now, how is it going to work out in every situation? You need discernment. I can't answer a thousand and one different circumstances, obviously. Everyone has to have discernment how they should approach this particular bishop priest situation. It, 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 there's places where you you might do very be very patient and not immediately walk away, depending on the stance of the person, how, what degree they're deluded, the, what what kind of delusion. There's a variety of circumstances, and nobody can answer that uh, with one one comment or one rule. Uh, and there needs to be discernment. That's why you have spiritual fathers. That's why you go to the spiritual father and you and you seek that. And you should never take it on yourself. To, to make those decisions. You also consult the, the spiritual father or the, the abbot or the, the bishop or whoever it is that you're consulting who's orthodox. Is this an orthodox thing that's going on? Is this the orthodox faith of teaching? Is this an innovation and departure from orthodoxy and what should I do? How should I respond to that? Is it a, is it a level of personal error or is it now being preached and taught as orthodoxy when it's really a, a, a delusion? All these things need to be discern but the the monk, the monk is in the same position as the as the people uh, the monk has a a much more intense and tight and uh, uh, strict obedience in terms of his daily spiritual life so he'll go daily and, and confess his thoughts he'll have a much much closer and more intense uh, a spiritual uh, training that goes on right uh, so you know that some people some lay people try to make that kind of obedience possible in the world it's not really possible it shouldn't be even attempted that that kind of daily intense you know i go to my spiritual father with every thought and that's not possible in the monastery it's it's a struggle for the abbot if he's got a big monastery how much more outside of that so practically speaking it's not really possible and they're not expecting lay people to have that kind of intense obedience so the question of obedience on in the spiritual world now if the abbot in, introduces heretical teachings he introduces women for instance it was a men's monastery or young children to the monastery, those are all grounds for leaving the monastery. Those are grounds according to the teachings of the Holy Fathers. Um, so uh, I, yeah, I think that answers that question. Um, and God help us, you know, it's always a very, very difficult thing to do and to even take those steps, it's very difficult. Uh, let's go to the, the other questions I'm going to answer on Thursday, probably. Let's go to the questions now here. Do we have any questions, John? Let's see them. All right. Uh, all right, yeah, GPU. Somebody pointed out it's not GPU, it's GRU. I think GPU is the is the Russian, ver Russian version, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I'm not really sure. It's not important. It's the secret police. That's what's important. What can you tell us about the connections to these Russian renovationists and the School of Paris people who seem to have total control of our seminaries and our diocese in North America? Is this in a future lecture? Um, that's a that's definitely a lecture worth uh, of discussion about how what happened there. I've been really it's been really interesting for me the more research I'm doing for this time period in Russia to see some of the connections in the diaspora, the Russian diaspora already. It's apparent, like with Berdayev and Bulgakov and their roots, uh, but with somebody like Evdokim, who was in America, or Platon, or uh, uh, Alexander, some other bishops who came to America and their connection to either the Holy Tradition or the Renovationists. Uh, I'm not prepared to, to talk about that, though. There's a lot more research I would want to do before I came and, and, and talked about that. It could be a future lecture. It won't be a part of the 10 lectures we're doing right now. It's uh, beyond that. Uh, but there's, it's a mixed bag for sure, from my the, from the knowledge I have at this point about what happened after 20, 1920 when you had this uh, exodus of intellectuals from Russia and what they set up in Paris and in, in in New York and all the rest. That's a big discussion, mixed bag. A lot of uh, discernment is necessary, and uh, I would say. I don't know, I can't say much, but I would say generally you want to be careful and have discernment uh, for sure when you go and approach a lot of those intellectuals and what they're talking about, because they're, some of them are just not orthodox, like Berdayev. Could you discuss the treatment and mentality of the faithful put into the gulags? That's what we're actually going to be talking about next week. We're going to be talking about the lives uh, of the new martyrs uh, from 17, some of us, we're going to choose three or four, we can't talk about them all. 
Uh, we're going to talk about how they resisted, what they did, what they uh, went through. Uh, some of it will be about their time in the Gulag. We'll talk about what happened and uh, some experiences from Solovki. Uh, so, yes, that'll be next week. And um, I think you hope you join us for that, and we'll get into that next week. In today's ecumenism, is today's ecumenism a form of, renovate, of revisionism? Is today's ecumenism a form of revisionism? You want to say renovationism, maybe? Is that what you want to say? Uh, well, certainly the renovationists were ecumenists. And so I would say it's it's part it's part of the same spirit of secularism, of the spirit of Antichrist. Secularism is the spirit of Antichrist. So when you see the church becoming the world, becoming working according to the methods and, and methodology of the world, uh, adopting the world's views, obviously, on dogmatic issues, all of this is the spirit, is secularism, it's all uh, a process of uh, the march toward Antichrist or the, the rise of Antichrist in, in, in terms of uh, the, the spirit throughout the world. So ecumenism, now let's define our terms, ecumenism, there's the ecumenical movement, an historical phenomenon which had people involved who were orthodox, some of them remained and gave an orthodox confession, uh, not, not too many of them, unfortunately, in my experience, in my reading. Uh, but that's a movement, an historical reality. Then there's ecumenism with the ISM at the end, right? So we're talking about some mentality or stance or teaching which is not uh, inspired by God, but it's a ideology. It's a it's an, it's a it's a purely fallen human uh, event and 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 effort. Uh, so that's ecumenism, and that is. According to our great Saint Eustine Popovich, the, the heresy of heresies, the pan heresy. Why? Because it instead of it being a promotion of one particular view, heretical view of one particular heresy, it's the acceptance and the uh, the the churchification of all heresies, essentially all the Protestant, the Roman Catholic. The, Papal Protestant and Reformed Protestant heretical ideas and teachings, the filioque, the papal primacy, and all the various uh, Protestant heresies and delusions are essentially um, recognized as life in Christ, as Christian life, uh, in, especially in Vatican II. After Vatican II, they recognize that all the various heresies are baptized. They're baptized Christians. In other words, they, they have a, a life in Christ. They're already a part of the church in some incomplete way. These theories, which are entirely modern theories, who have nothing to do with patristic theology, have no basis in patristic theology, uh, are uh, heretical ideas that undermine the salvation of the very people who promote them and the return of those people to the one church and the church's own uh, life and the boundaries of the church. That ism, that, 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 that heretical ideology and idea is... Um, certainly an innovation, and so in that sense, it's a renovation of the church, it's a, it's a distortion of the church, it's a, a revision of the church, no question about it. Uh, I, I don't think it grows necessarily out of the renovationist movement in Russia per se, but though that group of intellectuals who made up the renovationists uh, in, within and outside of Russia certainly became ecumenists and were ecumenists and were part of the ecumenical movement, certainly. And then I think a lot of them adopted the, the heresy of ecumenism. And unfortunately, the Moscow Patriarchate <clears throat> had a very ecumenistic and, and still does uh, stance in many ways in terms of these issues. Uh, they're, they're, the prophetic word is lacking to a, an amazing degree among hierarchy, the hierarchy today in freeing people from the illusion of, of ecumenism and, and, and uh, renovationism today. Uh, let's go on, another question. What does the church say about killing Bolsheviks? Well, I don't know if the church has ever said anything about killing, murdering, or slaughtering anybody. Uh, certainly that's not what the church teaches and wants. Uh, I don't know of any statement about like some kind of blessing or some kind of uh, uh, approval of killing anyone. I don't think the church responded to the Bolsheviks with force. That was not the the way the church chose to do that. They don't do we don't do that as Orthodox Christians. We don't go. And, it's just the opposite. So uh, I don't know of anything the church has said about killing Bolsheviks. Uh, I don't think the church had positively spoken about 
uh, resisting evil in this way. The Lord says the opposite in the gospel. It's very clear. He says the opposite. Uh, so resistance, and the reason why we celebrate the new martyrs is because they're martyrs. They didn't fight back and try to kill their, their persecutors, right? They're martyrs. That's the quintessential, uh, the, 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 the most exalted state of the Christian is to give his life, lay down his life for Christ, not to take the life of one who's uh, in the grips of delusion and heresy, which is the, uh, the, the humanist, uh, the surgeonist and the, uh, the renovationist, as I say, and the Bolsheviks. Ah, uh, let's see. Any other questions? We don't have any, any questions that I want to answer tonight. Uh, we'll answer them on Thursday. So I guess that, that will wrap it up then. If there's no more questions, oh, we do have another question. Some of them come in late. Uh, St. Sarah from Sarah sent, once said, acquire a peaceful spirit and a thousand around you will be saved. With this wisdom in mind, thanks to your work, I have found peace with the conflict within the church. So my question is, any advice for other Christians, including Orthodox, who may be struggling to find peace amidst the conflict in the church? Well, I'm, you know, one of the reasons why I'm doing this series is exactly to give examples to uh, all of uh, the, the brethren uh, of how the saints dealt with it, so that they, and they see, first of all, they put things in context. I mean, we, we don't have the persecution they had in the 20s. We don't have people sending us in exile. Uh, we don't have any of that. So let's put our sufferings in proper perspective, first of all. Secondly, um, we need to discern the spiritual nature of the beast. We need to understand the boundaries of orthodoxy, right? So that we're not fighting against something that is not a uh, threat to orthodoxy or in a departure from the boundaries of orthodoxy. It's a personal error. We have This is the whole process of discerning for ourselves. And when we do that, then that brings us peace. When we have ignorance, when we have fear, that's what creates the anxiety, right? That's what creates the anxiety. So God... Well, how do we acquire a spirit of peace if you're not totally trusting the Lord? Then you won't have a spirit of peace, right? You have to increase the trust, increase the faith. Realize everything's passing. It's very simple. We're, very, we're here for just a few years. It's all very temporal. We're not taking anything with us. Uh, the, the everything that's going on, the Lord knows. He's seen. He's, he's seen it from the beginning of the from before the beginning of the world. He's seen everything that's happening. He knows and he's allowing it to happen. And he will intervene, God willing, as he sees fit. <clears throat> so all of it is for our salvation if we want to struggle, according to the uh, example of the saints. And hopefully this, the examples of these new martyrs will give us that great courage and, 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 and uh, desire to imitate them. Today we celebrate their memory. In heaven they are celebrating at the throne of God. This is who we need to imitate. And we should, in a way, give thanks to God that we have an ability and an opportunity to suffer for Christ, to be thrown out, to be outside the gates, as it were, of this world and of the powerful of this world. We should give thanks to God that we can suffer for his name, we can confess his name. We have so few virtues in our day and age. We're all very poor Christians. Even the great zealous ones who think that they are great and they speak a great game, they're poor. I'm a poor Christian compared to the saints. We, we, we live indulgent lives, lazy, slothful lives, most of us. We indulge our eyes. We indulge our, our, our bellies. Uh, let's be honest who we are in this day and age of apostasy and then thank God that we have the opportunity to at least confess his name, confess the truth of the church, which then will be our salvation. And this has been promised to us by the saints of of, of, of times past, that the, that the Christians in the end times, simply by confessing Christ, confessing and not betraying him, without any great virtues, without any great asceticism, without any great deep prayer, I mean, all of that we should struggle for. None, none, of course, we should never become complacent. But even if we don't achieve great heights in that, in our day and age, because of the delusion is so massive and so pervasive with the, the use of technology and the propaganda is so... Uh, refined, that staying faithful to Christ in this day and age will be seen as a great ascetic exploit. It'll be seen as a great ascetic achievement 
by the grace of God for all of us Christians. So all of that, I think, should give us peace and make us joyful as Christians, that we have an opportunity to suffer, to confess, and to save our souls. Another question, are Archbishop of Erkey or Metropolitan Fuller of New York considered saints? Well, officially, they have not, not been glorified except by maybe one or two small uh, old calendars groups that I know of, uh, Mr. Ron Filaret. Uh, but certainly they're considered saints by the faithful in the sense of we don't, in the Orthodox Church, this idea that we don't wait for some papal committee to tell us who a saint is, right? We don't wait for the Patriarchate of Constantinople to tell us who a saint is or the Patriarch of Moscow. They come and confirm that which has been received already by the faithful. The hierarchy confirms that which the faithful embrace. So the faithful write the services, the faithful write the icons, the faithful begin the veneration. And that spreads of, of, by the spirit of God and by the providence of God spreads throughout the church. So you see that with, with certain figures today who are unofficially canonized. They're glorified, but they're unofficially so, right? And they, were, they didn't become saints when they were enrolled in the, in, in, by decree of the synod. They were recognized as what they already were. And the faithful knew that they were saints before they were recognized. And even, even if they're not recognized, they still venerate them. St. Nicodemus the Hagarite, about 150 years until he was officially enrolled in the uh, uh, Synaxarion of the Church of Constantinople. What do you think? The people waited around until 1950 to write a service to him and celebrate his memory? No. No. They had icons made of him long before that. St. Seraphim of Sarah throughout the whole 19th century. You don't think people considered him a saint and they didn't venerate him? Of course they did. So I would say the faithful, let's rally around those who have shown themselves to be followers of the Holy Fathers, who have shown themselves to be holy and venerate their memory. It doesn't mean you're not going to go around saying they're the saint of the church. You're not going to play as if you are an authority and you speak for the church. Only the church and council speaks finally and definitively. Uh, but that doesn't mean you are passive, indifferent members of the body of Christ. You play your role. Everyone has their role to play. And in terms of the saints, it's the faithful's veneration and love of them that ultimately brings about uh, the general consensus and then the confirmation on the part of the hierarchy. You know that we have tens of thousands of saints who've never been officially glorified. They, were, they didn't do this until much later. The first millennium, you don't have official glorifications until late. Uh, so all those martyrs in the first 300 years, they were never officially glorified uh, by some local synod. They were celebrated, and then that celebration entered into the, the, the liturgical books and the synaxarion, and then that, that, was just, that was just de facto recognized by the church over time. We didn't need, martyrs don't need to be, you know, we, with a few exceptions, unless there's some kind of real question as to their the reason they were martyred, for instance, that we have political martyrs, or perhaps their life really was scandalous or something, but that they end up being a martyr. Even then, even then we have people who denied Christ and we became martyrs. Denial of Christ, is there anything worse than that? And yet they became martyrs. And that, that martyrdom washed away that sin. So, so I think that the, the church needs to, draw close, draw near, and celebrate their saints in every age. And, and that's the great strength. And God gave us these great men of wisdom and confession, like Archbishop of Berkey, Metropolitan Philaret, for that purpose, to uh, be strengthened and to glorify him and to be uh, stay on the narrow path uh, of salvation. Uh, let's see if there's any other questions over here. Father, could you briefly talk on the importance of acknowledging the role of the demons in our lives? <clears throat> acknowledging their role. Hmm. In today's world, we act as if the demons do not exist. We see this in our approach, in our daily spiritual lives as individual members of the church and all the way up through the ecclesiastical structures of the church. How can one confront an enemy when he refuses to acknowledge his enemy's very existence? Well, that's a very good point, Subdeacon Matthew. Um, certainly the saints don't ignore them. And so we can learn how to deal with and understand and, 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 and encounter the demonic in our life through the lives of the saints. If we're lead, reading the lives of the saints, we'll see examples in that that'll give us great uh, clarity 
as to their nature, as to their ways, as to their methodology. Um, you know, it goes without saying their existence. It, it is, it's, it's comical for an Orthodox Christian to ever, even possibly imagine that they don't exist. It's everywhere witnessed to uh, again and again throughout Scripture and, and church history and the lives of the saints. So um, it, the, the, um, the role of the demonic uh, in our day is especially felt because we are seeing the, the prophetic words, uh, the book of the apocalypse come to fruition, and that is there's a loosening in the world because of our apostasy, the Christian apostasy, right? That's, that's the key that opens up the pit of hell at the end of time is the apostasy of Christians. So insofar as we, Orthodox Christians first and foremost, but all those who call upon Christ's name to a certain degree, on a certain level, a Lord only knows, their contribution to the whole. Uh, but I, there is obviously a difference between somebody who calls on the devil and somebody who calls on Christ. They're not the same. So there is something among those who call on Christ in terms of not uh, encouraging and following the, the demons. But it's in the church, in the baptized, chrismated, communing, Orthodox Christian, confessing people where the real battle goes on. And the test is, and insofar as we apostatize, then the door to the demonic is opened and further and further. You can see that in Russia. Why did that? Why was that allowed? How did that happen? How did these demonically possessed people become rulers of the church of the great holy Russia? Isn't that blowing? Doesn't that just uh, mind boggling? What had happened? It wasn't because. The Germans wanted to put Lenin in a boxcar, and he somehow manipulated millions of people in Russia to follow him. Now that's that's the that's the tempter who's always the door waiting. You gotta open the door for the tempter to come in, right? We freely open the door in our own lives, but nations do that as well. So the demonic can't come into our life if we don't give him rights to come into our life. We don't say yes, come into our life through our actions and our apostasy and all the rest. So that, uh, that process of apostasy, opening the door to the demonic, no longer trusting the master, no longer entrusting our lives to the master. And uh, all of this process of apostasy is what opens up the demonic. And so in our day and age, we see that, that the fruit of that, right, the fruit of that. And Father Seraphim Rose, for instance, of one of many, says very clearly, we have entered the end times. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean five years, 10 years? People always want to quantify. You're not going to, don't quantify it. You don't need to quantify it. You're not going to quantify it. Nobody can. So anytime somebody starts talking, you know, really with surety about time, like in three years, in 10 years, it's a waste of time. It, it, there are those who speak of time. They have a, perhaps a special prophecy that God has given them, but it's, it's not in terms of the end time. Right, the, the second coming, right? But generally, even those expressions of time are problematic because repentance, the degree of repentance, is what will determine how quickly these things come to pass. The, the enemy of our salvation has been knocking on the door to bring about his Antichrist for 2,000 years. He's wanted to do it from the beginning. He's not patient. He wants to have his power now, if possible. Uh, so in every generation, he's trying to achieve his goals. How and when, when, how will it come about that he will be able to achieve it one day? Because the Christians, Orthodox Christians, will have apostatized, will have, will have become so secularized and so worldly that he will have no uh, hindrance, no resistance to his plans, and he will be able to march, uh, you know, take his Antichrist and march to the to 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 completion of his plan. So anyway, I think I've answered it. I don't know if I've answered it, but definitely it goes without saying that the, the demonic in our life we need to encounter. Uh, of course, the whole spiritual life is, and the whole science of the spiritual life is how to deal with the flesh, the world, and the devil, right? That's that's the, uh, the process of purification from the flesh, the world, and the devil is the spiritual life, the process of growing spiritually and becoming uh, worthy of being illumined. And so reading the lives of the saints, reading the, the, the text by St. John of Climacus on the ladder or 
uh, Saint Branson, Ignatius Branson of the Rena, or any number of books that are are, are classics of of the spirit. Saint Isaac the Syrian uh, is a set of comedies. It goes on and on. And there's also contemporary books of great elders in our day. So all of those things go to play into us becoming knowledgeable, becoming spiritual warriors, being mindful of how to counter the demons in our life uh, on a personal level, but then also on a, on a general level, uh, the discerning the spirits generally. Uh, I think I've said this before, and I'll close with this question now with this. And maybe, I, I mean, it's a very big topic. One could go on for quite some time. But I remember when I first encountered Orthodoxy, it was with Father Sarah from Moses' book on the Orthodox from the Future. And what struck me was the fact that he had the discernment of the spirits. This he understood and could give very good explanations of how the demonic was working in the world. That is a sign that we are we are actually living the spirit. No one can talk like that if they don't have experience of God. They don't have a positive experience. They've not been purified and not been illumined. They can't talk like that. They can't have that discernment of spirits. So again, anybody, any Orthodox Christian, bishop, priest, patriarch, lay person, doesn't matter, it doesn't talk and talk to the people about how to counter the demons, who doesn't train the people how to do spiritual warfare against the passions and the demons with, which are be behind the passions. Uh, I don't know what I don't know what to say. Are they orthodox? What are we doing? Uh, they're possibly a part of the of the worldly spirit and they, they're, they're not leading people to salvation. It's that simple. Like that's the job of the priest and the bishop and the and the spiritual guide is to train the people in how to war, do warfare and become victorious against the flesh, the world, the spirit of the spirit of the world, and the demons. Those, the, those are our enemies. And the uh, whole spiritual life, the whole side of spiritual life is basically that, right? Demonology. You can't have dogmatic theology without demonology. You can't, if you don't know what the fall came about through the demons. So the whole of our theology is about the redemption from the fall, right? The, the freedom of man from the consequences of the fall and death and sin. Well, who broke that? The demons. So you can't talk about Orthodox Christology, Orthodox dogmatic theology without understanding that the role and the, and the impact of the demons on our, in our life. It's that simple. All right, any other questions? Let's see. I think we're done for tonight. Let's see if there's any over here. I'm done with that. Would you consider future toll lectures on the toll houses if possible? Uh, I would consider it, but it's not a huge priority because if you have access, if you have access to the book that's been published by St. Anthony's Monastery, what is it, like a thousand pages with the tr tradition of the church from all over the Orthodox Church, from Romania, Greece, Russia, and so many witnesses in the lives of the saints and all the rest, you have the answer, the Orthodox tradition. I know people, very good people, who do not want to accept the toll houses because they have, I think, probably an idea of what the toll houses are, which are not, is not re representative of the Orthodox tradition. It's not reflective of the teachings of the saints. It's a distortion that they think is being promoted as the Orthodox teaching on the toll houses. And so they're goodwilled, good Orthodox Christians, uh, and yet they reject the toll houses. So I think it's really important for people, probably the best book in any language on the toll houses is that book by St. Anthony's Monastery. Uh, and I would highly recommend it. It's just it's so extensive. Um, I don't remember the, uh, the title uh, C, uh, but if you go on their website, St. Anthony's Monastery website, it's right there. Somebody who can help. Oh, uh, anybody? Yeah, that's a good book as well. How Our Departed Ones Live is a good book on that subject as well. Yes. Uh, can anybody give me that title? I don't remember the title right now. Uh, put that title in the uh, in the chat box there for our for our people. Uh, good night, Kiko. God bless you. Departure of the Soul. There you go. Thank you, Maria. So the Departure of the Soul is what you want. It's a... Um, uh, let me post it over here in uh, in YouTube as well for people who are interested. All right. Parts of the soul. Thank you, John. All right. God bless you. Thank you for being here. We'll see you next week. We're going to be talking about some wonderful examples.
for imitation and for inspiration uh, from the lives of the saints of the of those saints who were martyred from 1917 to 1927. Then we'll go into a course uh, lecture all about Sergianism and Patriarch Metropolitan Sergius and his declaration and what the saints had to say about that and how they reacted. Very important. That's two weeks from now. And then, and then we'll have more on the Orthodox response and the consequences of Sergianism uh, the following week. So, and then we'll get into the saints from 1927 to 37, 38, uh, and what happened to the Orthodox Church in Russia from that after the declaration. What were the consequences, but also what happened to the saints? Where did they go? What happened uh, all the way up into the purge in the 1938? Uh, and then we'll end uh, with a. Uh, an attempt to take all this and apply it to our contemporary situation with some commentary on the lessons learned from the new martyrs for our church today. Uh, I'm not going to cover everything, obviously. This is a massive topic. We're trying to get to as much information and, and insight as possible, but I really highly encourage you, if you don't have it, download this book. Let's see if we can get it. There we go. Russia's Catacomb Saints, Father Sarah from Rose, Ivan Andreev. Uh, there's a, also a number of other books and great material uh, that I've posted through Patreon, and I think I posted on social media. A number of uh, things you can download online. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of books in circulation right now, uh, some things that have been out of print. But spend time. Don't be satisfied just with these lectures. Go deeper and encounter it. Read Catacomb Saints, amazing lives, and they're very inspirational. We're not going to cover it all in this lecture series. We're just going to introduce you to it all. So then from that point on, uh, you need to become, uh, go sit at the feet of the saints and become their disciples and read their lives, and it'll be much, much more uh, profitable for you. All right. God bless you. We'll chant the Chaparri into the cross, and we'll see you uh, on Thursday for those who are in Crowdcast Patreon, uh, and the rest of you next Tuesday. So son kiri et lon su kev longi son tin kleronomi an su ni kastis basi lemsi Catan barbaron dorum enos, Ceton son filaton, Dia tu stavrusu polite To the prayers of Holy Father, Jesus Christ our God, have mercy and save us. Amen. God bless. Good strength.